Prepare yourself for Earthling Entertainment with your hosts, Joe and Ryan. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Earthling Entertainment with Joe and Ryan. I'm Joe. I'm Ryan. Hey, what's up? What's going on, dude? Oh, yeah, you know, just living life, doing our thing. Today's going to be a great show. I'm actually super excited about it. Me too. Yeah. So, uh, you know, as usual, we're going to start off today's show with spooky stuff, followed by another installment of The Sequel Game. We'll see if Ryan knows anything no, uh, more about movie sequels this week. Probably not. I'm we, kidding. I'm we trying. might. We might. We don't know. Uh, <laughs> then we got our headlines. And then finally, we have uh, Chucky Season 3, Episode 1 Review. So Ahsoka's over. Now we're going to focus on Chucky, partially because it's Halloween and partially because it's actually a really good show. If you uh, are a fan of that horror series, all seven films, not counting the remake, are uh, canonical in the show. So it's, it's a real treat. So if you're a fan of Chucky, wait until the end. Uh, until then, it's just uh, our normal earthling entertainment. But let's start out with a little idle chit chat. How you doing, bud? I'm um, doing good. I've been just kind of binge watching uh, Chucky series because uh, I, I started with, you know, the new episode that we were going to review. I had never watched it. And by the end of that, I'm like, all right, I guess I got to watch the first two seasons now because it was really good. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so that's pretty much what I've been doing. I've been watching that, uh, just going to work, doing my thing. Surprising amount of lore in that show. It it was really, it was really good. Like, I was shocked. And uh, I love uh, Jennifer Tilly in it. Oh, yeah, and the fact that she's still doing it, like, 20 years later, because, I mean, she was uh, from Bride of Chucky was when she showed up, and I think that was 1998. So, literally, that's almost, tw- well, that is, it's 25 years later, she's still doing it. Yep, and they, they really dove into her character in season two. Totally, but, but we'll talk yeah. we'll talk more about Chucky later. On uh, So, a couple business things. We are moving the show to Tuesdays, so next week and every week following, uh, we will be Tuesday. It's simply because uh, I do a lot of production jobs. I'm a day player on some Chrysler commercials. He's a player. He's a player. Uh, he's a player. <laughs> excuse me, Chevy commercials. <laughs> and um, long story short, a lot of their scheduled uh, stuff is on Wednesday, so we're moving it. But that does mean we get a show on Halloween. That's pretty sweet. Yeah, so that show on Halloween is going to be super 100% Halloween-centric. So As I'm if a- we aren't kind of halloween Anyway, I mean, uh, we like the spooky. We like, you know, we like that kind of shit. I do like the spooky. I do. I do. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Spooky stuff. The Naklavi. The Naklavi comes from Scottish folklore and is sometimes called the Devil of the Sea. It is a demonic creature from Orcadian that is the Orkney Isles of Northern Scotland. Its head is similar to that of a man only ten times larger. It has an incredibly wide mouth that juts out like a pig's snout and a single red eye that burns with a red flame. Hairless, the Naklavi's body is also skinless, its entire surface appearing like raw and living flesh. It is said that its thick black blood can be seen coursing through its veins as the muscles writhe with every movement the monster makes. Its long, ape-like arms hung down to the ground from its gaping mouth spewed a foul black reek. Well, god damn it. <laughs> you, you, you'd hate to see it, you know? you hate to see it. Well, that's, that, that's pretty much like, oh, imagine a nightmare. Like, that's, I would just, yeah, I think I would just die from a heart attack from seeing that fucking thing. All right, so Scottish demon. So, yes, it's it's apparently a Scottish demon is what, yeah. uh, this is Sea creature. This is pieced together, by the way, by our one and only Joe. This was, uh, it it was much folklore to put together than could possibly be found in one article online. But you can find it right here on Earthling Entertainment. We're going to have to start, like, posting stuff. Yeah, I'm going to start linking some articles on our Facebook page. Yeah. Like, like, and you could even, like, upload this, because you, you put a lot together here. Well, we'll see. In any case, let's continue. All right. About the, the Naklavi, or what's it called? Naklavi. The Naklavi. The Naklavi supposedly takes a different form when it is in the sea. 
Although no surviving tales account for what that form looks like, either way, it's definitely not a pleasant sight to encounter on a lonely stretch of coastline. Some believe the Naklavi are a part of the Fair Folk, but all agree they're creatures of sheer evil. Its sole purpose is to plague the islanders. The Naklavi are the most malevolent of the demons in and around the Scottish islands. So there's other ones. Yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, all, <laughs> to be fair, all folklore, all mythology, you got to have a couple, right? You can't just have one devil. Looking at you, Christianity. <laughs> <laughs> Simply put, it has no redeeming characteristics whatsoever. The monster was often blamed for disasters that were known to afflict the hardworking folk of Orkney. If crops were blighted by sea gust or mildew, if livestock fell over high rocks that skirt the shores, or if an epidemic raged among men or among the lower animals, Naklavi was the cause of all. Its breath is venom, falling like a blight on vegetables, and with deadly disease on animal life. God damn Naklavi! You can always come here making my vegetables all black and die and rotten and I don't know what they're saying. Getting the club, the club got my crops as well. Yeah, see, I didn't even try to do a Scottish accent. I don't think you did either, but I mean. Nah, I did a southern one. We should just start blaming the Niklavi. Oh, man, I watched Brave. I can do it. Oh, all right. No, I'm kidding. I'm not going to. I. Anyways, <laughs> horrible Niklavi. Continue. Just in case all that misery isn't enough. The Niklavi was also blamed for any droughts that could seriously ruin a harvest. Clearly, the old Orcadians regarded the Niklavi as an incredibly powerful and dangerous creature. Yeah. The old practice of burning gathered seaweed to help kelp and fertilize the crops was said to really piss off the Niklavi. The creature can't stand the smell of the pungent smoke. It drives the demon into a diabolical rage. Despite the fact its name means Devil of the Sea, it's only when the Niklavi is ashore that it spreads its terror. During the summer, it's held back by the Sea Mither, or Mither of the Sea. Well, sorry, Mither of the Sea Witch is a mythical being. No, of... I think it's Mither of the Sea Witch is a mythical being. Not like saying she's a sea witch, right? Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, well, it, it's spelt like witch. Well, like, then, I... then I guess it's a sea witch. I don't know. That's what I thought. It, that's why I thought the, the period was misplaced is a mythical being of Orcadian folklore that lives in the sea during summer when she confines the demonic force to the ocean depths until her strength wanes with the spread of autumn. That's when the evil Naklavi is free to once again come ashore. Oh, well, shit. So in the mm -hmm. simplest terms, the Naklavi is a sea creature and is tolerant, it, sorry, intolerant, of fresh water. The only known way to escape from it is to cross or enter a stream, river, or lake. Notably, it also will not come ashore when it is raining. So that's good. But hold on. So this next thing is, all right, so this was a quote that I found, but I could not find who wrote it. So I don't know if this is an actual eyewitness or if this is a, a artist's creative license, you know, recounting like a, a tale where someone encounters Niklavi. I don't know. So I wrote down unknown witness because it reads like an actual thing that happened. So Ryan, when reading this, I want you to do a, a very awesome voice. Go Bloody hell. Bloody hell. The nightmares. Been on watch two nights in a row. One just appeared right there, right in front of me, 20 feet had to be at least 20 feet away, towered into the sky, got my flare to go off in time to see it pick up a, a couple wounded jerrys in the mud. They don't have bloody skin. There's just muscle and fat. The thing on its back wasn't human. No way could it be human. Had no skin either, no legs. Just merged straight into the horse at the stomach. It took a couple sh I took a couple shots at it with my rifle. Did absolutely nothing. Like I was shooting at it with a slingshot. 
It stopped soon as my flare reached at its highest point and turned. It looked straight down at me, both the horse and the thing on its back. It smiled. Unknown witness. Oh, hey, dude. No, for real? Well done. Well done, Juan. Thank you. Thank you. I was, I was trying to do, like, a tougher Russell Crowe. That was a performance, <laughs> uh, That was a freaking performance. Ugh. Oh, we got it. it, it does, is this Naklavi as well? This is Naklavi as well. So, this is uh, just a little bit more on the Naklavi, the... Yeah, I guess that's it. I, I don't know right, why I had to right. repeat that, Ron. No, the, uh, the Tale of Tamas is what, how I'm going to pronounce this. Uh, Tamas. Tamas? Tamas. All right, I'll go with Tamas. Late one night, and no doubt after a few shandies, an islander called Tamas was walking home by the light of a bright moon. He reached a section of the path with the sea on one side of him and a little freshwater lock on the other, when he suddenly stopped in his tracks. Something was moving towards him up ahead. Tomas thought it was somebody on horseback, but as it got closer, he started to realize it was far, far too big. Whatever it was, he had that cold dread down the back that told him it wasn't good. But with water on both sides of him, Tomas had nowhere to go but backwards, and there was no chance he was turning his back to this monster. He stood his ground and said a little prayer as he began to make out the horrible figure of the Naklavi before him. The wide mouth, mouth of the horse's head was sneering at him while steam belched out of it. Its single red eye stared right into him like fire. Tomas watched as the red, raw flesh Rised, writhed as this creature had been turned inside out. Even in the dim moonlight, he could make out the black blood pumping through its veins. Tomas's eyes kept moving over the beast, stuck fast with fear as it steadily walked towards him. The head of the human esque part of the monster was rolling around like it was going to fall off at any moment. The cold dread down his back had turned into pure ice as Tomas was shaking like a leaf. The only thing he knew was that Nanaklavi couldn't stand fresh water, so he forced his legs back towards the lock. As Tomas stood awaiting his fate, the horse head lowered down in line with his. Its vast jaws opened up like a terrifying yawn, and a hot stench filled his nose. Huge arms swung down to grab the terrified man, but he instinctively stepped back into the lock, splashing one of the horse's legs. The beast let out a horrible thundering snort as it stepped away from the water. The swooping hands just missed, dragging Tomas with them. He saw his chance, darting past, and with fear serving like a rocket up his backside, Tomas legged it along the edge of the lock. He knew there was little river up ahead, and he could make it, it that far, it, then the Naklavi would not dare follow. But he wasn't there yet, and the monster was hot on his heels. He could hear snorting and roaring behind him like a storm on his tail. Just as he reached the river, he felt more than saw the long, swinging arms coming for him, and he dove right into the water. Wading to the other side, Tomas looked back to see of the Naklavi screeching on the other bank. As he panted for breath, he saw the only thing he had lost was his bonnet hanging from those enormous arms. There are plenty of dangerous creatures in Scottish folklore, but nothing, and I mean nothing, compares to the horrible, the terrifying, the downright evil Naklavi. If you ever do visit the Northern Isles, especially Orkney, then maybe you should wish for rain. One thing is for certain. Don't mention the Naklavi's name out loud. Whoa. That was a heavy-ass story. I, I hope I read it well. You I was, did read it well. <laughs> I was, yeah, I like it. 
Dude, that was a hell of a fucking campfire story. I know, it's creepy, man. I mean, that's what we're trying to do, right? So for spooky stuff, we don't want to just cover the obvious things that everyone's heard of. So uh, me and Ryan, prior to, you know, me finding this information, we didn't, we've never heard of the Klavi. No, and no. Well, I assume in Europe they definitely have heard of it a lot because, you know. I, I've seen a gif of one of a naklavi yeah and like i always just kind of thought it was a skinwalker but the way it looked no no no, it was a naklavi it's crazy right like all right so half melted into the horse but like it but like it's riding the horse so not like a centaur because it still has a horse head and then the long arms coming down to the ground essentially and then but basically all of it being skinless it is that is disgusting and horrifying and my god what an amazing couple's costume that would be. That right? would be. But man, god damn, yeah, you'd have to have the fire eye and shit. I mean, it's like if Vecna was half melted into a horse from uh, Stranger Things, to be clear. Vecna from Stranger Things. Yeah, it, it reminds me of kind of like what it like, almost like a, a, a skinwalker centaur is skinwalker. almost like. What is skinwalker again? Skinwalkers were like, they always had like the big antlers and shit, and they usually like looked like really fucked up, like dead, undead creatures. They were uh, from uh, Native American folklore. Are, are you sure? Are we talking about Wendigos? Yes, but I believe that they were also like called Skinwalkers. Uh, the, Maybe I'm getting them mixed up. You might be, but uh, so could I be. You know, and plus it's Indian folklore. For and for all I know, there is many entities that have antlers. So I don't know. Yeah, but I don't know something about yeah, dude. These, we should these look. Things... We should look up more of that. I'm gonna try to find some Native American demons and stories. That's gonna be fun. But no, we gotta upload this photo of them because it, that's sweet. That oh is, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. yeah. Uh, he looks he looks pretty badass. Not gonna lie, the Naklavi is uh, a lot of artist renditions of like what it looks like. Sometimes the horse has one eye. Sometimes the rider has one eye, uh, because it's described as having one eye, but it's never clear as to uh, which one or both or what. It's like Brave Two, Rise of the Naklavi. Like, ah, oh, shit. <laughs> that would be horrifying. Like, oh, my God. <laughs> You're like, all right, we got to give this guy what he wants. There's some crazy... De- you know what's weird is they say it's a sea creature, right? And it comes out of the sea. So I get that it comes out of the sea and it mimics a rider on a horse. But why would... I mean, it doesn't seem like a sea creature, right? Like, that's why I was interested because out of all the articles I read, there was only one that mentioned it looks different when it's in the water, but there's no surviving uh, tales of what that looks like. Because that makes sense to me. Like, if you're a fish or a snake or a shark or any kind of sea creature, hell, a jellyfish, and then you could come out on land and transform into a rider on a horse, and that makes sense to me. But, I mean, if it's just a rider on a horse, does he just kind of, like, walk into the water and then Walk on the ground? I mean, maybe. Maybe there's an underground water city of demons. I mean, that's what H.P. Lovecraft always talked about. You know, maybe he's chilling with Cthulhu, man. Just carry a really nice squirt gun. (laughs) You'll be fine. What? Oh, because he's fresh water. The fresh water. Literally. Would you just make a random comment like that? You gotta... I I had no idea where you were going with that. But yes, yes, you're right. That's true. If you had a Super Soaker 2000, you'd be fine. Right. Like, they make... Bomb ass squirt guns now. So like, if you're really afraid of the Naklavi, just carry yourself a nice super soaker. Oh man, that'd be awesome. Like if you, all these Scottish people, we don't understand why, but they all have like water balloons on their belt, and they're I... like, you don't understand <laughs> why. <laughs> Fuck you, American. <laughs> we, uh, yeah. We, neither of us can do a Scottish accent, so, so we're I'm not, not trying. Gonna, to be not clear. even gonna try. <laughs> I can't do it. Not even gonna try. Oh man. All right. You know what? I think that was a, a rather fine spooky stuff for this week. What do I you thought think? so. Yeah, like I said, that last story was very, uh, very campfire esque, and uh, I, I enjoyed telling it. Well, you did a great job. I especially like the uh, the <coughs> unknown <coughs> quote. The yeah, that was yes, that was good. Yeah. yes, the bloody hell. You did bloody really hell. You did really well. By the way, uh, we do have some people who listen from the UK. We're also not trying to really do a UK accent. We we know it's terrible. We would love to send <laughs> us your best American accent. That yeah, would yeah. be hilarious. We'll, there if you, you go. <laughs> if you send it to us, we will figure out a way to play that shit on the air. We can insert that in later. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. yeah we could totally just, do just it. Just edit it. Yeah. Like, yeah. All right, no worries, man. <laughs> no, but no, because, yeah, it's all in fun. It's all in fun. This is entertainment, after all. Earthling entertainment. Earthling entertainment. Oh. Uh-huh. The sequel game. 
All right, so here we are with another installment of the sequel game. The sequel game. So, as you may or may not know, the sequel game is a game we do uh, pr pretty much every week. Uh, every once in a while, we'll be doing some other games. But this week, it is six questions about movie trivia. All the questions are the same. How many films in a given franchise? For instance, if we say Indiana Jones, the answer would be five. For every correct answer, Ryan gets five points. With the six questions he has today, that equals 30 points. After each question, Ryan will get the opportunity to name any of the sequels in that franchise. For every sequel he names, he gets an additional one point. This week, he has a total of 34 points he could possibly get just in naming sequels. So 30 plus 34 means the grand total of today's game is 64. Ryan needs 30 points to win. Everybody got that? All right. So, Ryan, are you ready for your first question? Down, down, down. Black Knight's going down. Down, down, down. I'm ready. Excellent. <laughs> so, Ryan, how many films are in the Transformers franchise? Now, this is the live-action franchise. The animated movie from the 80s does not count. Five. Eh. Ah. The answer is seven. Okay, I was off. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Can you name any of those films, with the exception of the first one, which is just called Transformers, because that's a given? Uh, Rise of the Decepticons? No. <laughs> Attack of the Decepticons? No. <laughs> Revenge of the Decepticons? No. Decepticons? No. <laughs> do, uh... do you have no idea what any Transformer has ever been titled? This franchise that's been out for almost 20 years. I think I saw the first one. <laughs> All right. And so, after question one, Ryan has zero points. The answer to the franchise is Transformers 2007, Transformers Revenge of the Fallen 2009, Transformers Dark of the Moon 2011, Dark Side of the Moon, Transformers Age of Extinction, <laughs> excuse me, Age of Extinction <laughs> 2014. Transformers, The Last Night, 2017. The First Morning. Bumblebee, 2018. And finally, Transformers, Rise of the Beasts, which came out months ago that you should have easily remembered. Totally forgot about that one. 20, yeah, no. 23. I, you know, I, I think uh, I had some Transformers growing up, and that's about the extent of my knowledge. Well, I mean, <laughs> I we, we did Beast Wars. We were the 90s. Yeah, I never had one. Yeah, well, fair enough. Nope, missed out on that. All right, Ryan, next. What? Excuse me, what? <laughs> <laughs> what? 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 Yeah, 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 come on. Where is it? Yell. What? Yeah, thank you. All right, Ryan, how many films are in the Bill and Ted franchise? I'm going to have to say three. Woo, that is correct. Yes. All right, can you name these films? Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Yes. Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. Yes. Oh, shoot. I don't remember what the new one's called, so I'm going to wage a guess at uh, the Bill and Ted. Uh... Oh, man. It's on the tip of my tongue. I'm going to just say reboot, but I know that's not it. <laughs> it's not Jay and Silent Bob, but... I know, I know. All right. The answer is, well, that's not it. So there you go. You got seven out of a possible eight on that one. So there you go. Not that's too good. shabby. No, that's not too shabby. All right. So it's Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. 1989, Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey, 1991, Bill and Ted Face the Music, 2020. That was, I knew it was something with music, I knew that. Oh, oh, you knew the Bill and Ted movie was something with music? How astute of you. Yes, but I knew that music was in the title is what I'm saying. All right. <laughs> Ryan, next question. How many films are in the Wrong Turn franchise? Not counting the remake. That came out in 2020. Four? Mm. Uh. Sorry to say, the answer is six. Damn. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, so this is going to be another another guess, folks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you you uh, care to guess any of these franchises? Uh, obviously, the first one is Wrong Turn. Yeah, but that one doesn't count for sure. Yeah. I'm just going to go ahead and say just Wrong Turn 2. But there is a subtitle. Uh, wrong Turn 2... 
The Revenge? Okay. No, no. They're just usually cheesy titles, right? But like... it's never, it's always The Revenge with you. Come on, man. Wrong turn. Come on. You got any of these? I have faith in you. Uh, do, 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 Hell on do. Wheels. <laughs> All right. I mean, I, I, I'll say that's at least a unique guess. I was going to say, I'm just kind of guessing here. Uh, hit and Run. All right. All right. Continue. Uh, Roadkill. Ooh, that's a good one. Anyone else? Uh, uh, <laughs> no, I guess I'm done, man. All right. Well, that is meh, 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 meh. The answer is no to all of that. And even my dog was like, hey, yeah, yeah, Pogo mm-hmm. agrees. I suck. All right. So uh, the answer uh, to that is Wrong Turn, 2003. Wrong Turn 2, Dead End, 2007. Wrong Turn 3, Left for Dead, 2009. Good game. Wrong Turn 4, Bloody Beginnings. 2011. Wrong Turn 5, Bloodlines. 2012. Wrong Turn 6, Last Resort. 2014. Yep, missed out on a lot of that. Yes. I, think I think I saw the first one. I don't even remember. Well, you know what, Ryan? You gotta get more on this uh, horror movie. It's Halloween, so you know what? Out of the giant list I give you of possible franchise that the games will be about, realize that it is October, so horror movies are gonna kind of be winning the day. All right, I'll get them next week, folks, but let's let's keep this rolling. Let's All right, rolling. so question number four. Ryan, how many films are in the Pumpkinhead <laughs> franchise? God damn it. <laughs> Nine. <laughs> the answer is four. Yeah. So there's three possible sequels you could name. Uh, and if you really have no idea, I would highly doubt you are going to get any of them. Oh, no. Uh, the c- Curse of the Pumpkin Patch. Ooh, I like it. No. <laughs> That's it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's uh, the great pumpkin, Charlie Brown. Yeah. Yeah. You know, <laughs> We're just going to move this right along. It is uh, Pumpkinhead, 1988. Pumpkinhead 2. Bloodwings, 1993. Pumpkinhead, Ashes to Ashes, 2006. Pumpkinhead 4, Blood Feud, 2007. All right, bud. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's only two more. And the funny thing is, I really tried to make this a pretty easy game this week. No, I guess I just, uh, <laughs> no, you picked the, the ones I guess I skipped. Well, quit skipping. Next we have Ryan. How many films are in the Terminator franchise? Six? Yes! Oh my god! (laughs) For a second there, I'm like, all right, man, you're killing me. You got, all right, sick. All right, all right. I'm happy about that. Would you care to name any of these movies? Um, man. I know Rise of the Machines is one. That is correct. That is uh, Terminator 3, Rise of the Machines, 2003. Isn't Terminator 2, Judgment Day? It is! Terminator 2, Judgment Day. And obviously Terminator, that doesn't count. Uh, then, uh, oh my gosh, you know, I I, I am the worst because I, I'm drawing such a blank on what the new ones were called, so I'm going go to go have, have to call it. You have to call it? All right. Yeah. <clears throat> so... The French. Well, you got you know you got seven points in that question, so that's not bad. All not right? bad. Yeah, that's not bad. I'm I'm with you. So right now you have a total of fourteen points. Points. Yeah. Nice. Well, I mean, I think it might be impossible for you to win, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll nice. take what I can not get. Bad. Anyway. <laughs> All right. So the franchise is The Terminator, 1984. Terminator 2: Judgment Day, 1991. Terminator 3: Rise of the Machines, 2003. Terminator Salvation, 2009. Wouldn't have guessed that. Terminator Genesis, 2015. Totally forgot about that one. <laughs> Terminator Dark Fate, 2019. Wow, I fell way off of the Terminators. I think I'd watched like the first two and that was it. Well, Terminator uh, Dark Fate had Linda Hamilton in back in it. And even Edward Furlong did a very small cameo, even though they de-aged him to like a 12-year-old. So I don't know how much of it was actually him. But apparently he was he was credited. So, I mean, there you go. Nothing? No, nothing. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. I, yeah, I guess, I, I guess I'm terrible when it comes to... Most of the time, if I like movies, I like the first couple, and I unless I'm obsessed with it, like Star Wars, I just I don't care. <laughs> Ugh. Anyways, so after five questions, Ryan has a total of fourteen points. Final question, Ryan. 
How many films are in the Star Wars franchise? Now, this is counting theatrical films only. They were only films that have come out in theaters. No straight-to-videos, no Disney Plus specials, no cartoons from the 70s, no Ewok movies. I know I can't fuck this up. Hold on. I know, you just said if know, it was Star I know, Wars, I you can't get fuck it. This up. I'll tell you what, if you fuck this up, I'm not we're this is it. We're never <laughs> doing the sequel game again. Cause yeah. All right. All Come right. on, Ryan. So it is gonna my I'm gonna have to say eleven. And what? The answer is twelve. What was the twelfth one? All right. Well would name any of these sequels, Ryan. All right. But yeah, you at least Star you Wars a new hope. Yeah, yeah. Star Wars: The Empire Strikes Back. Yep. Star Wars: Return of the Jedi. Yep. Star Wars: Episode One. What? Episode One. What? It was just Episode One. No, it wasn't. All of them have subtitles, sir. Mister Star Wars. What? You gonna what? Do? It was just Episode One. It definitely isn't. All right. Well, Star Wars: Episode Two: Attack of the Clones. Correct. Star Wars: Episode Three: uh, Revenge of the Sith. Correct. Star Wars: uh, The Force Awakens. Uh, yep. Star Wars The Last Jedi. Yep. Star Wars uh, Rise of Skywalker. That is correct. Uh, Rogue One. Yep. And uh, a Han, uh, Han Solo story. Well, uh, it's not the it, correct title. It was uh, Solo. It was just Solo. Yeah, well, technically Solo, colon, a Star Wars story. That, there you go. See, I knew it was something yeah, mixed All up. All right, so Ryan, episode one is... Episode one, The Phantom Menace. That was, fuck, I thought, I forgot that it had, yes, yes, I thought yes. it was just episode one. And Damn, the one that you up. are missing is Star Wars, The Clone Wars, 2008. Oh, the, 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 the cartoon movie. It was I released in theaters. I thought you said that no cartoon it, movies counted. I said if it was a theatrical release. All I didn't know that that was theatrical. All right, I, I think people can forgive me for fucking that one up. Ha <laughs> ha! Yes! Uh, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. You got 24. All right. Well, I'll take it. I'll yeah. Because, <laughs> yeah, honestly, the Clone Wars, I had no idea that was a theatrical release. And uh, Phantom Menace, forgive me. I th- really thought that, that was just episode one. I am I'm ashamed. <laughs> yes. So you know what that means, Ryan? I think I do. Now it's time for... Earthlink Entertainment. Headlines. Oh my goodness. Uh, I should have probably looked up how to pronounce this lady's name, so I'm going to give it a hard try. <laughs> Shauna Trickick, costume designer for The Mandalorian and Firefly, has died at 56. This comes to us from the AV Club. Shauna Trippick, Tripkick was a prolific costume designer. Tripkick was most prominent in the realm of genre TV, where she provided the looks for ambitious space set series like Firefly and recent Star Wars entries Ahsoka, The Mandalorian, and The Book of Boba Fett. A recent Emmy winner for her work on The Mandalorian, Tripkick has received numerous tributes this weekend from the Star Wars community with producer and director John Favreau writing in a post for the official Star Wars site that her creativity brought this world to life. Trickick's death was confirmed on Friday by the Costume Designers Guild. She was 56. A California native, Trickick worked in the early portions of her career in the costume department of films like What Lies Beneath and Barry Levinson's Toys. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty cool. But her primary arena, even early on, was television, including a long early stint as costume designer for Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Yes! That's my childhood. That's my shit. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Her, Her first major burst of attention came in 2002 when she was hired as assistant to costume designer Jill Oenenson for the pilot of Joss... Whedon's, Josh Whedon. Sorry, Josh Whedon's Space Western Flyer, bleh, Firefly. Yes. Sorry, this is a lot of... I like, don't know why you stumbled over there, but uh, yes, Josh names, Whedon's Firefly. Yes. yes. So uh, Firefly, obviously, we've talked about before. Brown Coats for Life. 
When Onison was unable to sign on for the full series, she recommended Tripkick for the job. The result was some of the most memorable costumes in 2000s-era television, as Tripkick em emphasized the show's deliberate blending of Western and Eastern aesthetics to create the looks for each of the show's characters, including doing design work on the iconic brown coats that would help define the series' identity for decades to come. That's true. And uh, what they're talking about is in this idea of the future, in this future galaxy, one of the main cultures that survived was pretty much like English and, and Chinese. So a lot of things uh, have Chinese writing and people speak Chinese and swear words and stuff like that randomly in the random speak because it's just those are the two most thriving cultures, I guess, in the universe. Uh, different cultures developed because it's far, 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 far into the future. But, you know, those are the ones that we would recognize from today. Cool. No, yeah. like, I really need to watch Firefly. Oh, I'm going to make you. Maybe what? we'll do a Firefly review. No, no one will care if we do that. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, yeah, we're about yeah. 20 years too late to do a Firefly re review. Yeah, we'll see. Firefly kicked off a long collaboration between Tripkick and Whedon. She would ultimately design costumes for several of his TV shows, including the last two seasons of Angel and all of Dollhouse. Love Dollhouse. My wife loves Dollhouse. As well as films The Cabin in the Woods. Yes. And Much Ado About Nothing. Shakespeare, fair enough. She also continued to spread out into other major sci-fi projects, including serving as designer on Torchwood mini, uh, miniseries, uh, Miracle Day, and the Torchwood miniseries titled Miracle Day. Thank you. So I was like that. I don't. I've I've never heard of it. Yep. <laughs> and short-lived superhero series Powers. I do want to say real quick, Torchwood is a spinoff of Doctor Who, and it is fantastic. Boy, Captain Jack. That is just a rabbit hole. I just don't ever want to go down the Some, Doctor Who. Someday we will do the the British sci-fi rabbit hole, bud. That I've never seen a single episode of Doctor Who, and I don't ever plan on it. Oh, well, now it's going to happen. <laughs> uh, all right. A lifetime Star Wars fan, Trickick joined The Mandalorian in its second season, working to flesh out the look of its faux Western take on the Star Wars universe. Writing about her today, series writer and producer Dave Filoni said that, Shauna had a deep love and appreciation for Star Wars. You can see that in every piece of work she did with us. She loved everything about being part of these stories, including connecting with fans and being part of that community. I feel like she has always been a part of Star Wars. Her costumes tell a story, providing the suggestion of a life experience that happened before the cameras rolled. I love collaborating with Shauna, and I will miss her presence. Trickick quickly became the go-to costume designer for Disney Plus's Star Wars series, having come back on The Book of Boba Fett, where she did updates and redesigns for the title character's iconic armor, and the recent Ahsoka, building on her work on the character's first live-action appearance in Mandalorian. She was also a regular at the Star Wars Celebration conventions, where she would often take the time to serve as a judge for the official cosplay contests. Oh, yeah? What a legend. Yeah, I mean, that's really cool. Yeah, I... I... I've never heard of her before. I, I hate to say it, but man, do I love her work. Well, what a shame. Unfortunately, a lot of film industry jobs, uh, you never hear of the people who have done these amazing things. Costume designer, you know, set designer, all these people, makeup artists. I mean, them, I guess you could think about a little bit more because you see like cool monster makeup. But if it's just, if it's a film where it's just a period piece and it's just beauty makeup or something like that, you don't think about them. You, all these great, wonderfully talented people so it's um it's sad that we haven't heard of her until now but i'm glad that we have now so we could you know pay our respects you know because so she, she did so much sci-fi stuff that i enjoyed uh torchwood my wife loves i watched it I, i'm a little bit more of a doctor who fan like we talked about yeah um but geez yeah what a and what a life i mean she did a lot in 56 it seemed... and she worked on toys i i Love that old movie. Oh, great uh, movie. And uh, there was a couple other there that I was like, wow, that she was involved in. But obviously, you know, I'm going to lean towards her 
recent work with Mandalorian season two. And uh, I mean, season one and two of Mandalorian is like top tier Star Wars for series, you, in yeah. my opinion. Like, yeah. I put those two and like Andor at the top. And uh, but she wasn't in Andor, but she was involved in Book of Boba Fett, which I also loved. I know that was a mixed reaction on the audience, but man, I loved that show. Well, it makes sense that she ended up working on those shows because Firefly was a complete sci-fi Western kind of feel. So that's what they were trying to bring in to the Star Wars. Yeah, call the call the woman due to the costumes. It makes perfect sense. And, and I could tell that they updated uh, Boba Fett's armor, and I really liked the way that they did it. So I guess I have her to thank for it. That's amazing. You know, I'd like to do a side by side comparison at some time because I I haven't I didn't really notice the updates, but I mean that's kind of the point, right? Yeah. Like it's supposed. To, like, I'm glad you noticed, but I'm just saying like it's it's supposed to blend in. You're supposed to believe it's the same armor and. I don't know. I wasn't really digging, but I, it looked like the same to me. He, uh, it looked like he, like I could tell, it had a new paint job. And, okay, and, fair enough. Yeah, and Mandalorians are encouraged by their creed. And even though Boba Fett kind of seems like one who doesn't really follow the creed, he still follows some of the traditions. Yeah, but he follows what his dad passed down to him because he's basically he. I don't even know if he really considers himself a Mandalorian. Even you know what I mean? Like he has his armor by right. Because his father passed it down to him. Right. But, I don't know. Did, but, they didn't really do Mandalorian stuff. Like, Django just seemed like he was a straight-up mercenary. So, as long as Boba's been alive, I don't think they were, like, doing Mandalorian practices. But we all know that he already repainted it because uh, Django was... Had, his armor was had blue highlights, whereas uh, Boba went uh, green and red. Yeah, absolutely right. Well, anyways, uh, she will be missed and wonderful costume designer. Oh, my gosh, dude. What a legend. Uh, moving on to this next one, Joe, I think you said that this was, uh, dedicated to a special someone. Yes, this is, this headline number two. Uh, why don't you state, say, say what it is first. I, Carly Reboot, canceled after three seasons at Paramount Plus. Oh, so rough. Now, <laughs> I was not a huge fan of iCarly, mostly due to the fact I was an adult at the time. But <laughs> we have a friend uh, who's unfortunately no longer with us, and uh, he had this stage performance where he basically played this like psycho crazy guy. And uh, I, I thought it was funny because that's one side of the coin. Because when you'd go over his house to hang out, he was just sitting down watching random Nickelodeon shows. I, I <laughs> He was watching iCarly. He was watching Danny Phantom and like all those kind of shows. And they were, they're all things we would have watched if we were younger, but we are just graduated high school. And he's just like, I'm just chilling. And this is how I wind down as I watch non-committal, like nothing goes wrong. You know, the hero wins, the bully gets punished kind of shows. So in honor of him, we're doing this story. This goes out to you, bud. All right. This comes to us from Variety. iCarly will not be returning for a fourth season on Paramount+. Plus. What? The series had a great three-season run and delivered on what fans really wanted to see with Carly and Freddie finally getting together. <whistles> we want to thank the entire cast, the writers, directors, and producers, along with the whole crew for their dedication, creativity, and talent said a Paramount Plus spokesperson. <laughs> it's like, it's like we just had some random guy. Like, hey, hey, hey <laughs> Says Jim. Says Greg. <laughs> Jim, yeah, Greg, could you please just, just po say this real quick? Hey, man. Fucking awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah, apparently, uh, we, we would like to thank everybody. Uh, so see ya. Uh, uh, excuse <laughs> me, are you a page? <laughs> <laughs> Ordered in 2020, the rebooted series picked up with adult Carly Shea, uh, Miranda Cosgrove, 10 years older, as she reunited with her brother Spencer, Jerry Trainer, the and longtime friend and cameraman Freddie, Nathan Cress. Freddie! And sets out to revamp her popular web show with the help of old and new friends. Uh, Lacey Mosley joined the original cast as Carly's new friend Harper, along with Jaden Triplett, who portrayed Freddie's stepdaughter. Millicent. That's a weird name. Millicent? Is, yeah, like... Like like Maleficent? That, that was literally where my head went. Yeah, Maleficent. Huh. Uh, the original series ran for six seasons from 2007, yep, to 2012 on uh, Nickelodeon. 
including yep. including oh my 97. God. That means he died before he got to see the end. I was just thinking that. So there was a whole nother year that he got that he missed out on. He was robbed from more iCarly, man. Uh recording Dang. 97 episodes. Yeah, well done. That's a, a successful show to say the least. They couldn't let him get three more. That is true, right? You know. Like come on, guys. I don't know how syndication works with uh all shows, but I know it used to be a hundred was the magic number. I was gonna say like there's like I'm sure there's got to be like some kind of trophy that they they're just like no, don't give it to them. You join the hundredth episode club. I Here. don't know why the emperor is now the leader of Nickelodeon, but he is. Well, if you know a little bit about some of the people who worked for Nickelodeon, he might be emperor. Show me more feet. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> iCarly was just... That was a deep cut yep. joke right there. Uh, iCarly was just one of several revived series set at the streamer. Paramount Plus also added new seasons of shows like Rugrats, a live-action follow-up to the animated series Fairly Odd Parents called The Fairly Odd Parents, Fairly Otter. Terrible name, but I, I would like to see that in live-action. I might have to check that out. As well as the recent Zoe 102 sequel film based on the Jamie Lynn Spears led Zoe 101. Do you remember why that show ended? No. I uh, okay. I could be wrong. I don't want anyone to get pissed off if I am. But I think I'm pretty sure she got pregnant, and that's why the show got. Oh, canceled. I did hear that. Right? I did. I remember that. So I'm not trying to like shame her at all. I'm just saying it's like what is what is the movie? Because like usually when there's a movie to a show, it's to complete threads like storylines that were never completed, which I it can't be the case here because it's like 20 years later. <laughs> yeah, and I hate to say this, but. We all, I was talking about Britney Spears being kind of a, a basket case lately on her Instagram and stuff. Sure, sure. Well, I guess, you know, with her book coming out, she was being very vocal about fighting with her sister a lot. And I wonder if this is the... She only has the one sister, right? I, I haven't looked that much into but, the Spears family. Well, I heard that one got voted off of, like, Dancing with the Stars, like, right off the bat. Like, she had no chance. Like, and they say it was the army of Britney fans. That we're like, now! Yeah, so I'm wondering if this is going to see the same kind of boycotting efforts. If, well, if, I mean, to be the fair, the, the Zoe 102 movie is already out. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's already out, and it's already a thing now. So, I mean, we could look up how well it did. but I uh, wonder, yeah, I wonder. And, yeah, and then after she got kicked off the Dancing with the Stars video, Britney posted, like, some video of her, like, adjusting a sweatshirt with a, a song being like, You jealous. You jealous. You're jealous. All right, so you know you're you're apparently following this family feud. <laughs> it's like a train wreck, bro. I can't look away. But uh, <laughs> all right, there's one paragraph left in this. The reboot was produced by Nickelodeon Studios and Awesomeness, and executive producer by uh, produced by Jay Kogan and Ali Shooten, uh, who also wrote the pilot. Cosgrove served as executive producer with trainer trainer. And Alyssa Vredenberg serving as producers. You know, it makes sense that uh, the, the chick who played Carly, uh, she would be executive producer. I mean, honestly, if a show runs long enough, usually the star ends up being an executive producer anyways. It only really makes sense. So, uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, I don't know how many <laughs> iCarly fans are out there, but this updated show was pretty much our same characters, except now they're dealing with dating and sex. And apparently it was pretty good, but it was still, like, family-friendly enough. I didn't really watch it, but for those who are fans, it is over after season three. We are sorry to see it go on your behalf, and at least your two favorite characters are now in canon boning. Hooray. <laughs> <laughs> Hooray. <laughs> All right, next headline, bud. All right. Telltale <laughs> Games. Faces layoffs. Dun, dun, dun. Isn't everybody? Right. This comes to us from My Nintendo News. In a year marked by layoffs across various game studios... Telltale Games has become the latest casualty in the turbulent video game industry. This distressing development follows reports of layoffs at prominent studios like Epic Games, Crystal Dynamics, and Team 17. The first signs of trouble at Telltale Games surfaced through a post by Jonah Huang, 
who, uh, a former cinematic artist at the studio. Huang revealed that a significant portion of the team had been laid off in early September, rising concerns about the fate of The Wolf Among Us 2, the sequel from the surprise hit from 2013. Yeah, did you ever play that game? No. Oh, it's good. Like all their games, it was like an interactive story with very little, uh, you know, just button button mashing kind of thing. But those games are perfect for ga- people who don't like video games because it's mostly a narrative. Like the things you have to do are just like target this thing on the screen and you have all the time in the world. Make a choice between A and B. Do you know what I mean? But it's actually really engaging narratives. They did a bunch of uh, a bunch of Tall Tales series. The they did Game of Thrones. They did. I know they did a bunch of Walking Dead. Oh, okay. So it's that I get you. Yeah, you know what I mean. They they cover that. They I think they did a Guardians of the Galaxy, like a, a bunch of Batman games. They're if you like that kind of gameplay, it's a lot of fun. I I could, I, I could see enjoying that. Like it's almost like reading one of those books where it's like you get to choose. Like do you go this? Do you go into the cave or do you go back to the cabin? I mean, on some level, yeah, that's exactly a little, it. A little bit, yeah. Uh, uh, Telltale Games has since confirmed the layoffs, citing current market conditions as the primary reason. In a statement, they expressed regret over the necessity of such actions and emphasized their ongoing commitment to storytelling. The studio also reassured that all ongoing products remain in production. It's worth noting that this iteration of Telltale Games is the second following the original studio's financial troubles in 2018, which led to its closure. The studio was later revived under LCG Entertainment, retaining many of its assets and intellectual intellectual properties. Intellectual properties. Stumbled on that one. That happens. As the gaming industry continues to grapple with uncertainties and challenges, the citation at Telltale Games underscores the volatile nature of the field. Layoffs have become an unfortunate recurring theme, leaving many talented individuals in the industry uncertain about their futures. The impact of these layoffs extends beyond the affected individuals to the projects they were working on, leaving fans of Telltale's storytelling anxious about the fate of ongoing developments. Well, you know, it makes sense because what happens is they have this great idea for a game and they've got to hire all this talent to make this game in any amount of time that would make it worth it. I mean, game development takes years. So they get all these people and everyone's working real hard at it and then the game comes out. Let's say it doesn't do very well or let's say it just does okay. They, all those people, they got, you know, they're going to have to get fired because they can't afford to pay them because they weren't recouping their money. I mean... It takes such a long time to make their next game, so unless they're tiered and they're coming out like you know every few months, that is their major revenue. So if a game flops, that I mean the the company could take a huge hit. And, and it kind of it reminds me of almost what you were saying earlier when we were talking about the the woman who passed away, where it's like all these people are so necessary, and and you and you you don't even they're unnamed, they're unthanked individuals, but we have them to thank for these great video games for the great costumes we see for all these things in, in that, that you don't think about beyond the stars. Yeah. I mean, no one expects you to sit there and watch all the credits to every video game and every movie you watch, but maybe we should. And you know, I would appreciate it. I've worked on a couple films where you could find my name if you were paying attention on the credits and uh, yeah, no, I'm sure no one has, but you know, to everyone who is a small name going up on the screen, you know, we, we salute you. Dude, we salute you. Thank you for everything you have brought to us. You've brought my life meaning where there was none. Oh, my God. We loves you. <laughs> All, right. All, right. All right. All right. All right. So in light of that, we are going to talk about headline number four. Ryan, go ahead. Joe. What's up? Uh, I just wanted to say your name back. Oh. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Can you say his name for me? I always get it wrong. Guillermo del Toro. Scrapped Star Wars movie that would have explored Jabba the Hutt's rise and fall. This comes to us from Nerdist News. Not that long ago in this galaxy... What's his name? Guillermo del Toro. Hope to make, make a Star Wars movie. You know, movie. I'm probably not even pronouncing it right, but I'm, I'm doing better going, than you. I, you're doing, but I, I can never pronounce that dude's name. 
uh, had hoped to make a Star Wars movie, the Oscar-winning director wanted to tell a story about the franchise's notorious crime lord, Jabba the Hutt. It's one of the great what-ifs in Star Wars history. The film would have featured one of Hollywood's best filmmakers exploring a truly iconic character in depth. What would that have looked like? Sadly, we'll never know. But in a recent interview, Del Toro offered new insights into what he had planned for Tatooine's larger-than-life gangster. During a recent sit-down with uh, Collider Del Toro, this, uh, with Collider Del Toro discussed his scrapped Jabba the Hutt project. He said his movie would have covered the rise and fall of Return of the Jedi's crime boss. The director also said his team designed a great world full of great stuff Del Toro was very happy with. What that all means exactly will remain the stuff of dreams for now and possibly forever. We don't have to guess nearly as much as to why the feature film never went into development, though. Del Toro said ultimately it didn't happen because it's not my property, it's not my money, and then it's one of those 30 screenplays that goes away. Translation, Lucasfilm didn't like it enough to go into production. Well, yeah, that's fair. I mean, the hundreds of scripts don't go into production for whatever reason. I mean, I'd be, I'd be into a, like, if we could actually like have like a scene on Nell Hutta, their home planet, which is like a crazy swamp world. That'd be kind of cool. It would be cool, and I haven't seen it, so yeah, that would be great. I don't think they've ever done it. Well, I mean, you know, it's maybe in Clone Wars. I just imagine Lucasfilm. They're weighing their options, right? Like, we get this director who is an Oscar winner. He's an amazing vision. He's a beautiful storyteller. But his script, we're not a fan of. And you just got to weigh, like, is it worth putting out a movie that might not be so good because we get the great director? Or do we just say no to the story? And, I mean, they made a choice. And that would be a hard audience for them to get on that, too, because you're talking all the older Star Wars fans who really, you know, know Jabba. Then you've got the new ones who probably aren't as, you know, fixated As big of Jabba connoisseurs. You know what I'm saying? Because, like, yeah, that was... Job of the Hut was a badass, you know. Like, <laughs> I mean, yeah, originally. So uh, let me let me continue. Uh, how much of the studio's decision had to do with the reaction to the franchise's other standalone films at the time? Had Solo done better in the box office, would Del Toro's Job of the Hut movie have happened? The director isn't sweating it. He said when he tries to answer why his movie never moved forward, he tells himself, "The more you swim upstream with the universe, the less you're going to realize where you're going." That's a great attitude for him, and probably also Jabba, but for a different reason. We imagine the Hut was not a great swimmer, <laughs> but that doesn't make us feel better about what could have been. We wish every galaxy in the universe got to see Del Toro's Star Wars movie. I do. I, I would have liked to see that. I would have too. Uh, it's surprising they didn't just turn it into a Disney Plus uh, uh, fucking show that's six episodes long. And, and what's cool is they're always mixing, you know, they've done, like, the, the Western Star Wars, you know what I mean? They've done, like, the, the spy Star Wars with Andor. So they could have done, like, a straight-up, like, mafia gangster style, almost like the well, Godfather with Jabba. Yeah, well, that's what they said they were going to do with the Book of Boba Fett. And I liked the Book of Boba Fett, but it was less crime lord than they may have wanted for me. It, it seemed... It seemed like, you know, decent Star Wars. It was Star more Wars, of like but... a redemption story. Like yeah. he became this good guy and, and uh... ran with respect and uh, was, you know, smashing away like the cruelties. He's not torturing people. So, yeah, they went and he was like super nice with animals and stuff. Like, yeah, so they went a weird direction with Boba Fett, but I really liked it. But It, it wasn't Godfather, but they said it was going to be. So, yeah, not, not like Godfather at all, but I could see where a Jabba movie or series could. They could run it just like an old gangster film, which would be sweet. I agree, I agree. All right, well. So, hey, guys, that's it for our headlines. And uh, for our final segment today, <coughs> we are going to do a uh, spoiler discussion on Chucky. Season 3, Episode 1. It's time for Chucky Episode Review. Now, there's going to be eight episodes this season, and uh, we're going to cover all of them each week. And just uh, for the Halloween season, even though we're going to get a little bit into, you know, November. And then I'm wondering, I, I'm not sure what show we'll do after that, you know? Maybe something Christmassy. Who knows? I'm sure there'll be a news show out. I don't know. What do you uh, think? 
maybe anything on the horizon you're aware of? Uh, didn't I hear they're doing like a Santa Claus series? I think they already, Wait, did, they already did that. They already did that. Oh, yeah, okay. I don't know how good it was. Anyways, so here we go. Chucky, season three, episode one, discussion on Peacock. That's right. Uh, it's actually on USA uh, two and Sci-Fi. But the point is, this show is crazy. We start out with a little boy, and he's in his room, and he's got Chucky, and he's in bed, and we're just like, oh, okay, this is a normal scenario for Chucky to be in. Uh, the mom comes in, and she's just like, how are you doing? And he claims that he, he hears ghosts in this place. And, uh, you know, he says that Chucky's name is Joseph, and that kind of throws the mom a little bit. Anyways, we pull out, and we are seeing that this house is, in fact, the White House. And uh, just, you know, to clarify, the reason why that weirded out the mom is because Chucky is saying his name is Joseph. Just, you know, good guy dolls all have different names. Chucky was just one of them. Well, this guy's like, hi, my name's Joseph. I'm your friend to the end. But anyways, we find out that Joseph is a dead kid of the mother and the brothers, you know, he's dead. He's a dead family member. And that's kind of what spooks him. Uh, the kid is the son of the president. Devin Sawa returns as the president. This is his fourth role in the Chucky series where he keeps playing different parts. Yeah, I was uh, I was shocked to see yeah Devin Sawa in the in the credits. I'm like, no way. We just keep bringing Devin Sawa back. The 90s heartthrob. Yeah, he really was. He was. Uh, he played Casper in. I don't know if he played the voice of Casper, but he played Casper uh, in human form. Yeah, and he uh, and Idle Hands. Idle Hands, but even before that, he was in Little Giants, that football movie with uh, right. Rick Moramis. That's right. That's right. But no, this this episode was really good. Uh, I, I like. If you're a Chucky fan, I think they nailed it. They've got like a new guy doing the voice. No, they don't. It's no, it's the same guy. No, it is Brad Dwarf, man. Oh my God, really? Because I thought I, I thought it sounded a, so. Maybe he's just getting older. I mean, it yeah, sounded I th- a little I, harsher. He's definitely just getting older. And his daughter uh, is the one who plays Charles Lee Ray in the show with makeup. So in season two, every time you see a flashback of Charles Lee Ray, that is uh, Fiona Dwarf. She's also the girl who has no arms and no legs. That is Fiona Dwarf, bud. I'll be goddamn. And that is Chucky. Maybe that's why it threw me off, and I just figured I'm like, oh, that must be the the voice actor. So I thought it was someone different. Oh no, 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 no! It's it's Brad Dwarf. But yeah, so the Chucky series. After we establish that we are in the White House, we meet the first family, and the president, who is played by Devin Sawa, has got elected on a uh, basically everything is transparent. We have nothing to hide. Kind of platform, which his young teenage son, not the one who had Chucky. Uh, is not happy about, and he's been doing TikToks and everything else to kind of just be push the envelope as far as being a a dick and a possible leak of public security. You know what I mean? No, it was a it, it was a good atmosphere for a Chucky film. There's a lot of yeah, there's a lot of pissed offness going on and family it, angst. Then of course you got the the freaking doll, so that, that you know some shit's about to go down. Yeah, so Chucky obviously has a plan, which we don't know what it is yet. And as the little boy is carrying him around, he mentions to his friend slash Secret Service officer that he could hear Chucky's heartbeat at night. And you could tell the Secret Service officer, he he doesn't believe him, but he believes that the kid believes it. So he's just on some level like, all right, that's weird. Uh, Later on in the episode, he sees Chucky and notices that Chucky has stole a letter opener that looks like a little sword from the president's desk, which uh, clearly would be a future murder weapon. And, you know, he's starting to put it together. Suddenly Chucky looks up at him as he's bent over and boom, he gets shot in the head with his own gun made to look like a suicide. Yep. Yep. He just Westerner pulled it out of his uh, holster and just shot him right up the chin, man. It was messed up. Yeah, you know, and as far as all the ways that Chucky could kill you, honestly, uh, getting shot in the head probably wouldn't be the worst. Uh, he's he's an opportunist, when, you know. Yeah, I, I think, uh, was it number two in the second film, Child's Play 2, 1991. Uh, he, no, actually, excuse me, 1990. Uh, he kills somebody with an air pump. Like, he, he literally stabs this teacher with an air pump and, like, pumps it up. These are some creative kills in slasher films, is all I'm saying. Uh, my favorite Chucky kill is when he kills her with a ruler. Oh, he literally yeah. just stabs a lady to death with a ruler. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, uh, while all this shenanigans are happening on the White House, they have to obviously have press conferences because, you know, a Secret Service officer discharged his gun in the White House. So 
uh, as this woman is speaking, our characters from the first three seasons are watching the news and they notice Chucky and they finally figure out that Chucky, where they've been looking for since the end of season two is in the white house. Not before, of course, being taunted by him and having him call them. And yeah. He gets straight up gives clues. him a call. Yeah. Like, and he's such an asshole. He does. <laughs> You'll never find me. I just gave you a clue because you know, I got security in yeah, this he's place. Like, yeah. He's like, yeah, that's basically what he said. He's like, eh, I'm pretty sure it'll be pretty hard for you to get to me. The security's a little tight. Yeah, because I'm Chucky and I'm a jerk. So he hints that he's somewhere with great security. They are talking about celebrity houses, all these other things, which when they notice on the TV, Chucky being carried by the first family. And, and at one point, he didn't he shut off all the power? Yeah, so they didn't actually say that was Chucky, but earlier in the episode, all the power goes out, and the first family is being uh, taken to an elevator, and you assume the bomb shelter that is below the White House. So my opinion is, yeah, that is Chucky. So He's yeah. testing the systems because he's got some grand plan that's going to unfold later, but they didn't explicit, explicitly say it was Chucky. Right, and him calling the kids, and like the scene with those kids, I was like, well, obviously... Devin... One of the kids uh, from the first one. He's yeah. Yep, and that's why that's what got me to start watching it. I finished season one. I'm almost done with season two. I think I'm on episode five. Nice, but, but yeah, because you're like, who the hell are these kids? And why are they involved with this first family? Right, and I'm like, these kids are about to take on the freaking White House. I apparently have missed a lot. Yes. Well, uh, <laughs> spoiler: through the course of the first two seasons, basically all of their parents are killed. <laughs> Like they're, they're terrorized by Chucky. All their friends and parents are pretty much murdered. Around like them. no exaggeration, and a lot of the kills were awesome. And like I said, Jennifer Tilly gets a lot. Like she gets like a whole few episodes just to herself. Like just about. She's her. a main character, so yeah. In the series, she definitely. I mean, she hasn't shown up yet in season three, but she is a definite main character. The whole murder mystery episode, I actually really enjoyed. Yeah, they have like a clue episode in season two. And that was pretty good. And I, I think it was her chance to really stretch it, like her, her acting skills on this genre, on this franchise, because she 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 adds so much to it. She really does. And you know what? Uh, I, I suggest anyone who's interested at all in anything that we're saying about Chucky, go watch the series, because the first seven films are all canonical in the show. Then they bring characters from those films all the way from the first one, we have Andy Barkley from uh, from the first film when he was like eight years old. And He's, Kyle, yeah, and Kyle from the second film, and you know, and more characters even than that. So it's a, it's a lot of fun. But basically, that's kind of it. The episode ends where Devin and his two friends, uh, all the characters from the first two seasons, know that Chucky's in the White House. We know that Chucky has a plan that he's working out in the White House. And the reason why the president and the wife of the president is tolerating this good guy doll being carried around by their young son is because they had another son named Joseph who died. And they believe the son, youngest son, is coping with his brother's death by having this doll with the same name. So that's our setup. That is Chucky, season three, episode one. And can I add, I love that they do kind of like a Crypt Keeper kind of introduction sometimes where Chucky's like basically sitting in front of a live studio audience and he's like, Hey, like, you know, like, like they did I, that in the second season. Yeah, I love yeah. that. And, and I love what they bring on this, like one wrestler lady who is like, I guess sent like some tweet being like, Oh, please. I want to be killed by Chucky so bad. Yeah. So the, what Ryan is talking about is, is exactly that there is a pro wrestler and she, and, and then Chucky's like, yeah, he's like in, it, this was after the tip episode. And he's like, well, he's like, the, the producers were worried that the fans would be mad about the lack of my action and my 10 allotted fucks per episode. She's like, really? You get you only get 10? He's like, yeah. So he just starts stabbing her. Fuck, 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 fuck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was fucking great. It's true, though. The uh, the producer, the guy uh, who has been doing Chucky since the beginning, he wrote the original. Anyways, he negotiated literally 10 fucks per episode. I and just, the amount of gore that you've seen in this film, uh, excuse me, this show so far. It had major South Park, the episode of sh uh, the, the Knights of Curse, with shit. Yes. I, it, it had not much of that vibes where he was just like, fuck, 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 fuck. Just, How many times can I say <laughs> this? Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I love it. Yeah, honestly, I've been binge watching it. I can't wait to finish it. I'm almost done. Perfect. Well, you know what? Next week, we're going to talk about episode two.
And remember, guys, next week we are going to be on Tuesdays for next week, starting next week, and for every week following. We are moving to Tuesday. So, yeah, make sure you mark your calendar for Earthling Entertainment. It's going to be coming to you every Tuesday. We are on, you know, Spotify, Apple. We got our own YouTube uh, playlist you can as get well. Your podcasts. Wherever you wherever you podcast, you can always email, email us at uh, earthlingentertainment at gmail.com. If there's anything you want to add, want us to cover, any questions. Honestly, you- if you hit us up on the Facebook page, you probably get a response a little quicker. Probably true. But yeah, all right. Uh, thanks, guys. And uh, remember that if you enjoy Earthling Entertainment, check out the other podcast we do called Tattered Tales. That is done with uh, my wife, Lizzie Wakefield, and Luke Williams. And uh, yeah, Luke Fisher. I, I'm not sure which name he wants to be said but there you go, and it's a great show. It is an anthology show, kind of like Tales from the Crypt or, you know, Black Mirror, Twilight Zone. It's a self-contained story each episode. All of them run in about a half hour, and yeah, it's a lot of fun. Sci-fi, horror, and check it out. Tattered Tales. Anyway. Every every now and then, I get to do a voice on it. It's true, and you can find that anywhere you get your podcasts. Beyond that, go to Green Brain Comics in Dearborn, Michigan, because I'm going to keep randomly giving them a plug until they start paying me. Green Brain Comics. Because that's that's how that works, right? Do they have a slogan? Read comics. <laughs> Read comics. Matt Damon. Matt Damon. All right, so from all of us here at Earthly Entertainment, see ya. Matt Damon.